Welcome to the RV Podcast. And this episode comes to you, well, right now from the Hershey RV Show. But we're going to focus in depth in this episode on everything you need to know about one of the most uh, misunderstood appliances on an RV, the refrigerator. Hi everybody, I'm Mike Welland. This is my lifelong traveling companion and my bride, Jennifer, and uh, they're all gonna wanna know where all the people are. <laughs> this is industry day. They're setting everything up. So it's a good time to be here. It's actually our favorite day because there's absolutely no crowds. If we can find an RV that's open, we can get inside, we can shoot at leisure. It's, uh, it's really a nice thing and we're really enjoying that. So it's been, uh, it's been really fun. Um, we are in Hershey, Pennsylvania, and we should tell everybody we did not bring Bo. Everybody no. wants to know always where Bo is. We were going to bring him. We were, but then the arrangements that I could make for him was a four by six cage. And yeah. I didn't want to do that to him. And our daughter was very gracious and hospitable and offered Bo a place to stay. So Bo is with our daughter. We're going to miss him terribly, and he's going to miss us, but I'm sure he'll be just fine. So this show, uh, we will have a, a video on Saturday that talks about some of the highlights in the show, some of the trends that we've seen. We are doing meet and greets. Uh, as this episode is being released, the show officially opens to the public on Wednesday. And uh, we have a meet and greet uh, Wednesday today at 2 p.m. at the uh, Battleborn Batteries display. And then on uh, uh, Friday and Saturday at uh, 10 a.m. We will be at the Keystone RV display and we'll be doing kind of a ask us anything there. So uh, so be sure and uh, tune into that. Uh, but we are excited. This is always an exciting show. I think it's our ninth or tenth that we've attended. And it's uh, it's like opening day for hunters or trout fishermen. It, it, for RV uh, people, uh, this is uh, the big one where all of the brand new models for the next year are introduced. And there's a lot of them here. I think there's 1,500 RVs from about 400 different companies. So uh, tens of thousands of people will be uh, lining up all of these little corridors uh, all the rest of the week. The show runs until Sunday. Uh, we are excited because Sunday we pick up uh, our brand new uh, motorhome, our Class C Leisure Travel Vans FX. We'll tell you about that uh, more next week. But uh, uh, for now, uh, we are going to focus this uh, this episode for an interview we had in depth about, uh, as we said at the top, one of the most misunderstood appliances in the RV world, which is the refrigerator. Man, we learned so much in this. We thought, I wish I had seen this episode when we first started yeah, out because yeah. I learned a lot of things the hard way. Why not learn the easy way yep. and watch this? So stay with us. We'll be right back. And when we pick it up, an extended interview uh, all about RV refrigerators, believe me, you're going to learn a lot of new things here. Tired of overcrowded campgrounds and competing for reservations, paying high fees for sites? Well, ownership is an emerging trend in RVing that might be right for you. It was for Jen and me. We bought some land just west of Nashville, Tennessee in an incredible collection of mountaintop RV properties called the Woodlands at Buffalo River. These are 5 to 62 acre properties that allow RVs year round starting at $79,900 and we loved it. The scenery is breathtaking and you can own it outright. It's not a timeshare, it's your property, your way. You can landscape, garden, bring your pets, build what you want to. There's high speed internet and it's so private. It's a great place to make your home base. No more calling around for reservations, ready whenever you want. And they're selling these properties by appointment, five to 62 acres, $79,900. Financing, big discounts available on multi-lot packages. For information, visit myrvland.com, myrvland.com. When we're on a road trip, we always seem to find a way to stop at a Camping World Center. There are over 225 Camping World locations across the country. And there's always one close by when we need parts and accessories for our RV or just want to shop. In fact, uh, we have so much fun with uh, Camping World. And as we talk about it as one of our sponsors, 
they have agreed to offer a 10% discount if you use the coupon code RVLIFESTYLE10 when you buy $99 or more in merchandise. You'll find everything you want from outdoor furniture and appliances, the ones you see us use in our videos and we talk about here in the podcast. RV extras that include everything from camping chairs to fire pits, electrical accessories, must-have gadgets. Check them all out. And again, don't forget, use the coupon code RVLIFESTYLE10 when you visit CampingWorld.com. All right, welcome back, everybody. Time now for the RV Lifestyle Podcast interview of the week, and this is going to be a good one. It's Todd Henson, and he has so much to say. It's going to be quite an extensive interview, and you're going to learn so much. Todd is with the National RV Training Academy. His job is to train RV technicians and they've also just launched an online course that you'll hear them talk about in which RV owners can learn a lot of this maintenance stuff. But Todd is simply a wealth of material. We wanted to have an expert on to talk about RV refrigerators, something we get all sorts of questions about. And we thought, okay, this would be a regular little interview, 10, 12, 15 minutes. But when we started talking with Todd, it was amazing the things that we learned. And we've been RVing for 10 years about refrigerators. I think they're gonna really enjoy this too. They are. So um, sit back and uh, check out this great interview with Todd Henson from the National RV Training Academy. Well, Todd Henson from the National RV Training Academy joins us right now to talk about refrigerators. Todd, it's a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me. So we want to talk refrigerators. And okay. uh, there are so many questions, so many concerns. You want to start us off? Okay. So how are RV refrigerators different than the ones you have in your home? Okay. Ooh, it's a broad question, but let's get into it. <laughs> so what we call your residential style refrigerator uses a compressor in order to cool down the refrigerator and, of course, your freezer. And with that, you have two different temperature controls. You can set your temperature for your freezer separately than setting your temperature for your refrigerator, but we use a compressor and we use refrigerant. Now, the RV style refrigerator, which is what we call an absorption style refrigerator, uses a different method in order to create cool. And what it does is it uses some chemicals. We boil ammonia and we mix ammonia with hydrogen and therefore we get a flash freezing effect. So we call it an absorption style refrigerator. It's It's been around for 150 plus years. It's actually older uh, technology than of course with our compressors. But it's basically two chemicals coming together. We get a flash freezing effect and then we just simply use thermal dynamics to pull the heat out. So I know I'm sure probably had no clue that, you know, or no interest in me telling you all that, but it's just the delivery mechanism that we have with an RV style refrigerator that makes it different. The cooling mechanism, you know, we're, we're using chemicals versus a refrigerant. Now, if you had to pick the one that's better, I would say the compressor is what you'd want to choose. Um, yeah, it's a bias. Can... It's a bias I have. And um, well, I'm going to say this is from me, not necessarily from you, because a lot of uh, a lot of people shy away from this. Um, uh, when we have the RV style refrigerator, you are told when you purchase your RV that the RV style refrigerator was designed to be on on propane while going down the road. That is not the case. Um, as a matter of fact, we have a lot of difficulties that we have to overcome because when we use propane as a source, there's an open flame, an open flame going down the road, right? So as a bias, if you have a residential style refrigerator or a compressor style, because now they have the 12 volt compressor style refrigerators, they are far safer and you get far better performance out of them. The absorption style refrigerator is an old technology that I wish would just simply go by the wayside. <laughs> and, and it is kind of, isn't it? I mean, we're seeing more and more. Uh, I hate to say this, but ours is behind us now. This Dometic, Jennifer, move your head. not a Dometic. Oh uh, no, it's a Norcol. Is that Norcold. I don't even know that I don't know that that's absorption or, or compressor. Yeah, so Dometic and Norcol are the two major brands that make an absorption style refrigerator. Um, and you will know this because when you go to replace one, you will find out that it costs more <laughs> to replace your absorption style refrigerator versus getting a residential style refrigerator. 
How can I tell what that is? Um, well, so when you open the, the uh, refrigerator door, there's going to be a data plate. One, it'll tell you uh, who the manufacturer it is, uh, who the manufacturer is, but does it run on propane? Yes. It runs on propane, then it's an absorption style refrigerator. Well, then that takes us to the question. We talked about safety. Uh, us included, most RVers I know run the refrigerator on propane as they're driving. Yes. You're saying that's a bad idea. It's a bad idea. Yes. So if we really looked at the mechanics, you know, in, in class we have, you know, uh, we show you this, but those, the cooling coils, which are on the back, if we have a flame that's actually heating up, what we're doing is we're trying to boil uh, ammonia. Now, ammonia in its normal form also has water. And what we're trying to do is just boil. Ammonia has a lower boiling point than water. All we're trying to do is separate the ammonia vapors from the water. So we have to have a heating source, right? And the whole reason why we're going down the road with our propane on is to boil that ammonia so that the, the vapor of ammonia mixes with the hydrogen and we get the flash freeze. The problem that we have is we have an open flame. As well, that's also the port where the air can flow in. Well, when you're traveling down the road, you're going to get low pressure on the outside of your RV, high pressure. Don't need to know that. The flame's going to go this way. And it has to heat up in that flue tube perfectly. As a matter of fact, we have what's called a spiral baffle. We want to heat that flame on the tubes perfectly because those tubes, those coils, have welds. If we're driving down the road and that flame comes out on the outside, now I'm heating the outside of that tube up. Not a big deal, but over time, what's going to happen is one side of that tube is going to get hotter than the other side. And one of the major failure points that we have is with the coils. And the coils will last for years if we treat that refrigerator right. But if we're traveling down the road and that flame gets pulled out and it heats the outside of that tube, this is what's going to happen. Everything stretches based on heat and metal stretches based on heat. The whole reason, uh, and I'll use cooking for this, you ever take a pan, a cold pan, stick meat on it, and then put it on the burner? What happens to the meat? It gets stuck to the pan. The reason why is the pan is flexing. It's, it's actually expanding. So you learn as a good cook, you heat your pan up first. It gets hot. It's already expanded. Now you put your meat on and it doesn't stick. So if I have one side of my tube getting hot where I have a weld, then one side of that weld flexes and the other side doesn't. And so we create a weak point. And it may not happen down the road, but over time, what will happen is, is we'll lose our compression. And inside there, we have hydrogen, which is flammable. Most of the time that we lose our coils, we lose the compression, our coils, no big deal, other than We've got to replace the coils and it costs thousands of dollars. But we mix that hydrogen and we have an open flame. We yeah, can have fire. a potential of a fire. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's that's pretty eye-opening. So yeah. I guess on our list, I'll make a quick list here. Get a compressor or fridge. Yeah. Do they cost yeah, so much more? I mean, why don't the manufacturers put those? Yeah, why, why don't they just do that? Well, um, they do, but it, it all goes back to what's available. And then if you'll notice that you already have a recall, more than likely, on your refrigerator. And that, you know, we're trying to find ways to keep that flame inside that tube. But in order for there to be a flame, there has to be air. There has to be an air source. So they, they put up, you know, um, uh, flashing. They put on high temperature limit switches. They do everything they can to monitor it. Okay. But the problem is because we were told, you know, that this is okay, we do it. Am I gonna say that everyone is going to catch fire? No, as a matter of fact, I even have the stats on that. Um, we get about 20,000 uh, uh, cases that are going to the insurance company a year for fire. Of 20, the 20,000 20, cases, 16% of those start at the absorption style refrigerator. These so are for RVs, 20,000 RV cases of fire? Two insurance companies, yes. Holy cow, that's a lot. That's a lot. Well, we got, right now, we got about 10 million uh, RVers out there. You know, 10 million, so 20,000 doesn't seem that big of a number when the pool is, you know, nearly 10 million. But of the uh, 20,000, 16% of those start at the refrigerator. So that's about one a day. 
Wow. Wow. You, you know, just a related uh, uh, question. Many times we've heard that the RV refrigerator always has to be level. Yes. Is that for the same reason? Because you want that tube uh, to be lit the proper way? Or yeah. Here's the proper the fun way? So there's three chemicals inside that tube. You have your ammonia and you have your hydrogen. Because ammonia also has water, we have water inside a metal tube, and that will eventually cause rust. So they add a powder called sodium chromate, okay? Now, if you looked at the back of your coils, you'll notice that they're not level. They're actually just slightly off just a bit. The whole purpose of that powder, the sodium chromate, is to coat the inside of those coils so they don't create rust. Well, the, the coils themselves, if you look at it, I mean, there's a very small slope. And we have to be exactly even for that slope. What we want to do is when the ammonia moves up, the sodium chromate goes with it, goes through the coils, and it constantly coats it. So our coils are this way. And if our rig is off just a bit, then we, we lose the slope. And what will happen is that powder can't move. And then it, because those coils are hot, the powder simply just begins to dry up and begins to crystallize. And I want you to think of your arteries, right? You got too much, uh, what's Black, stuff? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, whatever. <laughs> you start building that up and you're not getting the flow. Well, wow. if you're not getting the ammonia back, we're going to eventually lose the coils. So right. it's kind of ironic, the very thing we're using to keep the coils or prevent the coils from messing up is also one of the reasons why, you know, they mess up. And that's just simply because we're not exactly level. Now, no. travel down the road, that's fine for that part. You know, if you can run it on electricity, totally fine, because as you're bouncing, you're still moving the stuff around. It's when you're uh, parked and the refrigerator is on, because I get this question as well. Does my RV have to be exactly level with regard to the refrigerator when I'm in storage? No, because there's no movement. You're, you don't have it on. Um, but if you have it on, you need to be level. Got it. Um, fascinating stuff. So we'll we'll look for a compressor. Uh, what are some of the common problems that go wrong with all RV refrigerators that that the RVer can solve or prevent? Okay, so if you do use your propane, then you're inviting insects. Insects love the smell of propane right? And you have an open port on the outside. They love to build their nest, whether it's going to be in the burner assembly or in the uh, burn chamber. So if you are using propane, then I would recommend maybe twice a year, uh, especially uh, spring and fall, because when you go in the winter, not many insects. Spring and fall, uh, go to the back of your refrigerator and make sure that it's cleaned out. You know, that, you know, uh, spiders love to get into the burner assembly, create their web and then they end up dying because no one else comes and visits them <laughs> well that prevents you know the propane from flowing and everything else so we want to keep that you know keep that burner tube nice and clean you know you can look at it you know blow some compressed air get you a, a straw brush you know run that through there i mean it's real simple you just want to keep that area clean and while you're back there depending you know if you're rving in the summer you're going to see uh, dirt dauber nests and all that. So just go in and grab them. Don't even look to see if they're there. Grab the nest and pull it out. Uh, what other no, things? Look, look to see if they're there. Yeah, yeah. What other things go wrong? So some other things uh, that can go wrong. Well, there's some limitations. You'll notice with your RV style refrigerator, if you like to eat ice cream, you really don't get a good hard ice cream um, from the freezer. And that's because the limitations... On the RV style refrigerator, you're going to get about to 10 degrees. And if you have high fat concentrated foods, it takes a lower temperature to freeze them. So um, to me, uh, first off, if you're putting your ice cream back in the freezer, then you're just a quitter. You're doing it wrong. You should just <laughs> me but, too. <laughs> you know, um, you know, buy smaller, uh, buy smaller uh, amounts of ice cream. So just understand what he it. said. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. No ice cream back in. We eat it all. No over. ice cream back in. Right. You can do a sherbet. You know, something that's low fat or something like that. You'll get a good hard yeah. uh, ice cream. The temperature setting. You set it for the refrigerator. The the freezer responds. But the back of your refrigerator. Let's move to the refrigerator. You notice. For most models, there's no fan. 
And if we had a fan in there, we can get cooler temperatures. We're using, we're just using physics, you know, to move the heat over to the top of our refrigerator in the back. We have some evaporator fins. We already have a limited amount of space for our food. But one thing with an absorption style refrigerator, the last two inches, we don't want to put any food back there. If the food is all the way back and heat rises, then I can't get the heat out of the food on the bottom, you know, to go up because I've got it blocked off. So it's a huge limitation because, of course, the absorption style refrigerator is already pretty thin as it is. But we want to keep that back area nice and clean. If you see um, moisture on your food, big problem. That means there's an air gap somewhere, okay? The moisture forms because there's warm, moist air getting into the refrigerator. So the first thing is, is uh, know what you're looking for before you open the door. Don't go shopping, right? Don't open the refrigerator door and go, what do I want? Because the absorption style refrigerator uses a older technology. It takes one hour to recuperate one degree. Wow. Wow. So it, like if you hold it open for a minute, it'll take almost an hour for it to get that temperature back. So it's going to take just a little bit. Okay. Um, so just kind of make sure you, you know what you want, you know, and that's one of those things. I have a four door, so I'm always big. Just open up one door. Don't open up both. Um, second thing with this is it takes about 12 hours. Let's say you're traveling. Let's say, you know, you, you stack in your food because I'm going to go over some some tips and tricks for you so you can keep your your food cool and not have your propane on. Um, so make sure, you know, you know, with, you know, oh, I'm sorry, let's go back to the, the, the moisture vapors. Let's say you look in there and you've got moisture sitting on your food. And also on those coils. Right now. Okay. That typically means there's an air gap somewhere. And there's two places we can get that. There's the door where we have seals. So we want to make sure that that's all nice and clean. And then what we could do is a paper test. We used to say a dollar bill test. Take a dollar bill, close the door on the dollar bill, and then drag the dollar bill across. What you're looking for is nice, even um, resistance. If you get to a part of the door and it kind of moves over real quick, then we know that seal isn't really tight right there. Okay. So to address that, let's say the seal on our RV uh, refrigerator door, one, they don't make them by themselves anymore. You have to replace the whole door. So we're going to try and find a way to repair that. If you have a loose or dead seal, in other words, it lost its memory, take a hairdryer and lightly warm it up right there. When you warm that up, you relax the rubber and it, it finds its memory again. That's the only place we use the hairdryer. We do not use that in the freezer, but right there for the seals. The other thing is, is that drip tube. You know, the back of your refrigerator on the outside of the RV, let's say this is the outside of your RV, you got a drip tube there somewhere. Yeah. That drip tube should have a cap on it a lot of times that cap goes missing well the problem is or the reason why we have that cap is we want a little bit of water sitting right there at the end of the tube that prevents warm moist air from going up the tube and going into our refrigerator so if you are suffering with a lot of moisture a couple things either you're leaving the door open too long right and you got a lot of moisture going there you're sticking food in that's still hot and steaming um you, your seals are loose or you got air coming in that tube. So check the back of that tube and make sure that your uh, cap is on there. Okay. So it doesn't matter. Now you guys have a Norcold that you'll also have a little drip tray, right? And so some of the water is supposed to go in the drip tray. Notice the drip tray is real close to your burner assembly. Um, we will find out if it's overfilling. If it's overflowing, it's no big deal other than it just gets some water on the outside of your RV. Whenever you, whenever the refrigerator's on, that right there gets really hot, so it evaporates the water. But just make sure that that tab is in there. If your cap is not in there, you're gonna have to order one. What you can do in the meantime is take your tube, spin it in a circle, and create a P-trap. And then just put like a little zip tie or something to hold that, right? The water will go down the tube and has to build up and then finally go out. So it's a great, you know, it's an easy way to get that fixed until you get your cap. Now, mm -hmm. one thing you could do, sorry, one thing you could do is if you're on an RV park, you could just go find someone who has the same type of refrigerator. 
it still there. Still. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what we'd love to do, uh, uh, we can keep you on for two hours here, but uh, we'd like to kind of do like a little lightning round with you of questions that we've collected from our Facebook group. Oh, okay. I, I'm just overwhelmed by all the knowledge that you just shared. Uh, You're a right. wealth so of information we, here. Do, do you uh, do you want to start with some of the questions that we get? Okay. And, and, uh, and we'll go, okay. here are some of the reader questions okay. that we've had Maybe this week. All right. So we got to stop the jump. All right. <laughs> to extend the life of my refrigerator, the best to always have it on or turn it off when not in use. I've been told both. Yeah. And there's really no difference between the two. If if you keep it on, just make sure, let's say it's in storage. The one thing you don't want to do is keep it on and you not be around to check on it. Right. Because if something goes wrong, you're not there to stop it. So you can keep it on um, if um, if you're always around. But quite honestly, if you're not using it, no, you're not going to hurt it. It's not like a battery that will decay over time when you don't use it. I've just got chemicals down there. So absolutely, if it's in storage, don't turn it on. Gotcha. Um, we have a question about thermometers. Uh, do you recommend them? And what temperature should the refrigerator be and the freezer be? What's What can we expect? Well, we we'll go back to the refrigerator, right? Um, you want that between 34, no higher than 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, yes, I have one. It's a Bluetooth one where the temperature sensor is inside the refrigerator and I've got one inside the freezer. So I don't have to open it up. The monitor itself is on the outside. It's got a little um, uh, magnet sticks right on there. And the coolest thing is, is it also re will record the high temperature. So it gives me the current temperature, but let's say it, for whatever reason, let's say I lost power or something like that and it got up to 50 degrees, boom, it'll show the high and it records it and keeps it there. That lets me know, and that's so awesome because let's say I'm gone for the day or something like that and I had perishables, you know, or let's say I was gone for a week and let the refrigerator on, there's food in there. If I come back and I see that it was at 70 degrees, I know that I may want to go ahead and throw that food away because I don't know how long it was at 70 and did I spoil it, right? So yeah. it lets me, lets me know that. Well, we've that's, a a that's a, such an awesome idea of have, being able to read it from the outside because I'm standing there with the door open trying to figure out where yeah. it is, it's fallen down. I'm standing there a long time but trying to read it. So uh, thank you. That was really yeah. good advice. But uh, okay, another our, here's our another lightning round question from our Facebook right. group. Uh, the refrigerator in my class he says the temperatures are factory set and it freezes the eggs after a couple of days. Why is that? Some okay. say I need a fan. Well, so if it freezes your eggs, then you know you're, it, it's doing really well on the refrigerator. It just depends on what you have. You have what's called a thermistor, and that's what's regulating the temperature. If on the outside of your refrigerator, you can change the temperature, you want to go ahead and set up to its lowest setting. So in other words, you got a Norcold or Dometic and you've got your temperature and you got one through nine. Well, nine, you're saying you want it to be the coldest, one warmest. So the first thing is, is if your eggs are freezing, see if you can lower that number, which will increase the temperature. Okay. Oh. Second thing is, um, you know, with the eggs freezing, where are they located? Are they real yeah. close up to the top? Uh, next to the evaporator coils. If so, move them down um, towards the bottom. So uh, the warmest yeah. part, the, the coldest part is high. Warmest part is low. In the well, well, it's a contradiction in terms. We know heat rises. But yeah. We also know the freeze plate or the plate where the um, uh, heat transfer takes place is the evaporator fins right there. Upper so deep. if the eggs are located right next to the evaporator fins, heat runs to cold. That's the shortest distance for the heat coming out of those eggs are going. So we may want to move those down. Okay. On the Norcold that we have, there is no outside control, but on the inside, there's this little thing that moves up and down. Yes, it, that is your thermistor. When is the coldest? Like, it doesn't say you lift it up or is it? Which way, how there, should be, there should be a sign on the side over here. Now, heat rises. So if your refrigerator is too warm, you take that. I call it a paper clip. There's a paper yep. clip. That's what we see. But there's a little little thermistor. It's just a wire. We want to move it up because heat rises. And what we're telling the circuit board is, hey, it's not cold enough. Move it up. If it's too cold, move it down. Got it. Got it. Okay. We got we got a couple of others. Okay. Uh, refrigerator is cool, but not as cool as it usually gets. Notice the coils inside are very wet and dripping some water. 
All right. Again, water, I'm going to first say is I'm going to attack, you know, the airflow or the air. You know, we're getting uh, air inside the refrigerator. Check your fin, you know, check your seals, make sure they're closed. Check that drip tube on the outside of your RV. But also then consider, are you keeping that door open? Are you putting in food that is hot? And it just takes that much longer for it to recoup. All right. All right. Now, if if we've got a good working refrigerator, once that door closes, it's a sealed system. So the only moisture we have will be in the food itself. If you're waking up the next morning and there's still moisture, that means there's air getting into the refrigerator. Oh, that's it. Uh, here's one. It says, I have a 2018 Dometic refrigerator that has ice cold freezer, but room temperature fridge. The fridge is level. I'm getting power and I replace the thermostat thermostore wire, uh, other common causes uh, besides airflow? Um, uh, packing it too much. Packing. So we only have one set of coils on the back. So if the freezer is working, more than likely the refrigerator is working because we use the same coils. So if the freezer is working, the refrigerator is not, I'm still going to go back. Is there too much food or is there an airflow problem? We have one last question we want to hit, and then we want to talk about your home study course here. But this uh, is a okay. Domestic refrigerator whines when it's hot outside and really struggles to maintain temperature. A whining refrigerator when it's hot. What would cause it to whine? Is it an absorption style refrigerator or a compressor? This dometic. This says dometic. A dometic whining. Oh, you got me on that one. Maybe it's just not a happy refrigerator. <laughs> wine, wine, wine. It lo you loaded too much food in it. It's but it's, to, yeah, to it's not job. maintaining temperature. <laughs> I guess. Okay. If it's in a slide out, if the refrigerator is in a slide out, we have fans on the back of the coils. And I'm wondering, uh, what was the second part happens? It whines. And he said it really struggles to maintain temperature. Okay. If it's whining, that could be because you think of moving parts. There's really no external moving parts on a coil. Everything just takes place. All we have is heat. So there, there shouldn't be any noise. Now, if you hear gurgling, that's different from whining. That means, you know, that that sodium chromate's crystallizing and, and the liquid's just not moving. But if it's whining, I'm going to think of something that's moving. If the refrigerator is in a slide out, then on the back of the refrigerator, which you can't find, there's two fans, depending on the size of your refrigerator. That fan helps move the air. Because again, we're bending physics. We're, we're trying to get cool air to come in, to go across these coils, take the heat, and move it out. If your refrigerator does, is not in a slide out, we use what's called the chimney effect. Cool air comes in, goes straight out the top. If it's in a slide out, we have to make it do a 90 degree angle to come out. So they stick fans on there. I'm wondering if the whining is the fan itself, if it's got dirty, or if maybe some insulation or something has gotten one in, one, in the fan blades. If I'm not moving air, cool air through there, I'm not getting good performance out of that refrigerator. The way to be able to tell, get your ladder out. You know, your, your refrigerator should have a lower port and then an upper port. If you get the upper port, kind of look down, right? Get your flashlight or something and see what's going on with those fans. Now, it may work in the morning. You got better performance. But as the afternoon, it gets warmer and warmer and warmer. That's an airflow problem at the back of the refrigerator. So without knowing more, that's where I'm going to point them is to look for that, look for airflow pro uh, possibilities on the back of the refrigerator. Well, you have been so helpful uh, to us after 11 years. How, and, how would you not want to be you in a group of 50 people with all the questions? You would coming. never get out of there. Or you'd be someone. Well, but, and I can tell you, there's still a ton to learn. <laughs> oh, yeah. And what I get a lot is, of questions I don't know. I'm like, ooh, that's you know, kind of like this one. Hmm, hmm. Now, now, you guys do training of many RV techs around the country. In fact, I just hired one who came and did a great job, and he just was trained by you guys this summer. But there is a way that the average RVer can really benefit from the things we talked about today. It's, it's your home study course, RV. Uh, it's, it's, let me get the address and we'll put it up on the screen below us, but it is the RV tech course yes. com for a link. Yes. Tell us about that. And it's not just about refrigerators, it's about all the things that we can do ourselves to help our RVs get, yeah. get performance. There's, a, okay. there's about 30, between 24 and 30 hours of video and we got it broken up. I actually go over the major systems. I'm going to teach you about electricity. We're going to go over AC and DC. 
80% of the RV runs on electricity. And a lot of problems, you know, if you understand electricity, you understand what we call signal flow. We just figure out where the problem or where the signal stops. So think of a water hose and you got a kink in the line. You're over here at the end. You got no water coming out. You track it back. Oh, there's a kink in the line. It's the same thing with electricity, with water, uh, and with propane. So we, we teach you the concept of signal flow, where to go look for that. So I'll teach you electricity. I'll, I'll go over a lot of the problems that we have with propane. That's all mechanics, and it's usually self-inflicted. A lot of the problems we have with our propane is we don't know how it works, and we don't know all the safety devices, and we end up causing most of the problems. So I go over that with you, show you how to simply reset the system, and then tell you the proper processes. Go over how to maintain, clean these service intervals, but then we go over your four major appliances. I'll go over the absorption style refrigerator. I'll go over the air conditioners, the rooftop air conditioners, uh, water heaters, and then furnaces. Um, and with that information, you, you can take care of a lot of the problems yourself. You know, for most of us, if we just learned a little bit about how that works, we could fix it. So that's what this course is for. If you just knew how it works and then a couple steps on cleaning it, man, it makes it a heck of a lot easier when you're RVing and something goes wrong. Because now you can look at it and go, oh, I can fix that. Or you can go, well, that's beyond me. Now I'm going to call someone. But it gives you that that sense of um, um, comfort, like, okay, I'm not totally clueless on what's going on. And it's not because, you know, we're stupid in any way. It's just, no one's ever told us how it works. Right, that's, so that's the whole process. That's the whole concept of the home study course. Well, please know that uh, RELifestyle.com, we are very supportive of you guys. We have uh, just nothing but high praise for the for the uh, National RV Training Academy, and particularly for you, Todd Henson, who we hope we can have back many times to <laughs> answer questions. You have a, uh, and I'm sure you know this, but you have a wonderfully uh, 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 warm and welcoming way of teaching this stuff, and we thank you for educating us. We're going to go check our refrigerator. Again, we will put a link. We really recommend this course. And uh, Todd, thank you for being our guest and making this time and helping to educate our community. Well, I appreciate the opportunity for coming on and you know, wish you all guys all the best. And yes, um, we'll schedule this. And if you have more questions, hopefully they're, they're easy questions. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get them. Todd Henson, thank you for being our thank, guest. Thank you so much. Wow. Talk about feeding from a fire hose, right? <laughs> That was a lot of material that Todd gave us. It was. I hope everybody took notes and you know where to go hear it again in yeah. case you need to. Listen to it again or you can go to rvlifestyle.com in the show notes for this episode. We'll have kind of a transcript of the interview with Todd. But uh, Todd has so much to say that uh, and he really has a great way of teaching it and he doesn't gloss over stuff. Uh, even I understood it, so <laughs> it's pretty good. So we're going to have him back. There's a lot of other things we want to talk about with RVs, but uh, thanks to Todd. And again, uh, you can look at the bottom of the screen here. We'll put links to uh, all the information and uh, even the online course that Todd had. It'll also be in the show notes. Uh, so we thank Todd and the National RV Training Academy. We look forward to having them back on the show again. All right, we're going to take a quick break, and then we'll come back with your questions uh, from the Hershey RV Show, where it's industry day as we record this, and we're the only ones around. <laughs> when we're asked what's the most important modification we made to our RV, it's an easy answer. Battleborn batteries. Battleborn batteries are quality, safe, reliable lithium batteries that allow us to stay out there off the grid longer. Lithium batteries charge faster, they charge fuller, they're longer lasting, they're maintenance free. And Battleborn batteries are protected by a 10 year guarantee. Now, in our case, they just dropped into the existing AGM batteries that we have. And they'll probably be the same on your rig, too. Battleborn battery experts can get those in your rig just like they did with ours. They can also match you up with the right cabling, the inverter, the charger, the solar controller, everything. Jennifer and I swear by our Battleborn batteries. They allow us to boondock off the grid. Check them out. Go to rvlifestyle.com slash lithium. rvlifestyle.com slash lithium. All right, back for our question of the week segment. And this one was posted actually by one of our uh, members of our RV Lifestyle Facebook group. 
and uh, she went on at some length to talk about uh, what to do with an RV oven in her RV. It's just a, a trailer. There's not a lot of storage space in the trailer. She doesn't use her oven a lot. And she wanted to know if it made sense to pull the oven out and to build some sort of storage. So um, let's see if we can give her a couple of ideas. I think the first thing is... The first thing is if you pull that oven out, make sure you do it safely, cap everything off the way that it should be, save it, because for resale, the next person might be really excited about that oven. Yes, I would urge you, don't get rid of it. Make sure that you can put it in seamlessly when it's time to resell it. Um, it's a pretty important thing. But um, short of that, what a lot of other RVers do is use the oven for storage. And here is an oven. And if you're not going to use it a lot, you got a lot of space there. You can get a lot in there. Remove these racks and use it for storage. What, pots and pans, put some towels around them. You can use it for that. Excellent use of space and you don't have to spend any money. And if something happens that you need to sell your rig, resale value, it's there. All right, here's a question. This comes from Jack and he says, hey, I uh, see all the RV shows are starting up again. Boy, they are. The they Hershey, are. Hershey show here is just the beginning. You can look. Uh, Every weekend there, there's RV shows around the country. Jack says, is an RV show really a good place to buy an RV? Yes, yes and yes. You can find one here and maybe you can take it home as soon as the uh, show is over. You can put sold on it and uh, that'll give you such joy. Seeing that if you've done your homework, you know what you want. This is the place to come. If you're looking and it might take you five years to figure it out, keep coming, keep going through them all and figure it out. And it doesn't have to be this show, any RV show is just a great place to shop because you can go through the interiors, try them out, go from one rig to another to another to kind of rule out what you want. Take pictures, take notes. But they often will give you a much better deal at an RV show because you don't have to pay the transportation charge, they're already here and uh, the dealer would like to sell them as fast as possible. Here's a, a, a hint, look for something like this. See that? Immediate delivery. Uh, that means that, uh, and you'll see that at a lot of RV shows, that means that you can get it right away. You don't have to wait for months. So um, yes, an RV show is a great place. Now people always ask about trade-ins and yes, you can trade in. You'd, you obviously can't bring your RV into the show but you can put it out in the parking lot and uh, all these dealers, these manufacturers, I should say, they're all represented by dealers and the dealers here will go out and look at that RV and give you a mm -hmm. price. So yes, RV shows are a great place to buy. All right, that is the podcast for this episode. And uh, again, if you are coming to the Hershey RV Show 2022 edition, we look forward to meeting you at one of our meet and greets. Uh, once again, uh, Wednesday show opening at the Battle Brown, Battleborn Batteries display. We'll be there at uh, 2 p.m. 2 p.m. And then at 10 a.m. at the Keystone display, actually pretty much right where we are here, near the Arcadias, we'll be here at uh, on Friday and Saturday at 10 a.m. So we look forward to seeing you. Thank you guys so much for watching. We would love to get your questions and your comments. You can just reach us at Mike and Jen at rvlifestyle.com. Thanks for watching. Happy trails.